Our opening keynote is from a digital artist who uses computers to engage with people and inspire them. His passion is demystifying programming and exploring its artistic possibilities. His presentations and workshops enable artists to overcome their fear of code and to encourage programmers of all backgrounds, us, to be more creative and imaginative. So what better way to start the day uh, with this amazing keynote? Would you please give a very warm Symphony Live welcome to Seb Lee Delisle. Well, thanks very much, Tony. Well, I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, I love doing talks, especially to, to with, uh, with programmers. So I am, like Tony said, I am an artist, uh, but I make stuff with code. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a computer programmer. Who's a computer programmer here? Yeah, pretty much everyone. And every, who isn't a computer programmer? No one. Oh, there's a couple. What do you do, sir? Talk about computer programming. Oh, that, that still counts, right? I think that counts. Uh, yes, so I am a computer programmer. And, and like Tony said, you know, I love doing creative things with code. Um, I guess I always was a programmer, really, from when I was about 11 and I got one of these computers. Who started programming on a Commodore PET? Yeah, a few of you, Tony did. Yeah, it's quite a cool, oh, it's a cool looking computer, that one, isn't it? I really like that. My dad just brought it home from work, little green screen lit up. Um, they had a bit of an attitude, though, didn't they, those computers in those days? Didn't have any nice, shiny start buttons. There wasn't any apps. <laughs> Well, there was, but you know what I mean, right? It was just this blinking cursor when you turned it on. And to me, that blinking cursor was a challenge. To me, that computer was saying, what? <laughs> and you type something in, mistake. Oh, damn, so that's such a bad attitude, those computers. Um, but of course, you know, because I used to draw and stuff when I was a little kid, so my first impulse was to make pictures and animations. And actually, there was a bit of code that you could use uh, to make uh, graphics. I wonder if that's going to start. Yeah. And normally, I, I live code this, but I'm, I really have very little time today. So I'm running a video instead. So there's this little, there's this little one line of code that you can use. This is a, a Commodore 64. Um, and when you run it, it creates this sort of art, artist, generative art, right? We'd call it generative art these days, right? That's, we've, we've got quite pretentious about computing these days. But back then, it was just a cool little demo. And this was actually in the Commodore 64 user manual. Yeah, generative art was in the Commodore 64 user manual. In fact, um, this bit of code has become quite famous now. It's had a book written about it. Does anyone know, know about this book? Do you know what it's called? Well, the book's called 10 print CHR dollar brackets. Uh, what is it? 205.5 plus R&D1, close brackets, semicolon, go to 10. And here it is. It's a really cool book. I recommend it highly. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's edited by uh, Casey Reese, one of the people behind the Processing Project. Processing, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a programming language and environment specially designed for artists. I recommend it highly. Right, so how's that translated into modern day uh, computing? Well, I like to work with particles. I'm obsessed with particles. Particles are almost my favorite thing. And I'll show you some projects that I've made uh, using particles later. But I wanted to show straight away, rather than just talk about code, like the guy over there, I thought maybe I should just do some coding, right? Yeah, yeah OK. Oh, that was awkward, wasn't it? <laughs> Computer programmers, don't you just love them? Right, OK. So I thought I'd do some <laughs> uh, programmers. They're my people, right? You're my people. Yeah? Nervous laughter, or is it because I'm not a PHP programmer, is that? <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. We're all programmers. It's all the same stuff, isn't it? Right, so I've got this. Oh, can you see that? I might have to enlarge a bit. Right, so I'm going to do some programming now. I'm going to make a particle system. Yeah, because particle systems are, well, I'm just going to show you. Right, so 
Uh, this is my code, this is just my setup. It's just a basic blank HTML page. Uh, you can see I'm making a, an HTML5 canvas element and I'm putting it in the document. Yes, yeah, so I've got an empty canvas. Who's done canvas programming before, anyone? Yeah, a few of you. Canvas is great, right? If you want to do just some creative programming, canvas is absolutely great. Um, so let's, let's draw something. Well, unfortunately, the default fill color is black, right? So you wouldn't see much in this. So I'm going to, actually, what color would you like? Let's choose a color. I'm going to do, draw some particles in a color. What color do you want? Yellow, orange. Green. 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 That's too many. Uh, green. Someone said green. Let's go with green because we had a Commodore pet. Let's, <laughs> let's go with green. So I can just use green. Um, and then I'm going to draw a rectangle. Uh, and with fill rect, it's the canvas uh, command for drawing a rectangle. First two uh, parameters are the x and y position, and then the width and the height. So let's, let's do that. Oh, is, oh, there you go. Live reload is working. It doesn't always work. It just adds a little element of danger to my presentation. I'm actually really cold as well. I think my hands are seizing up. It's like a classical pianist, isn't it? It's like... <laughs> right. <laughs> It is also quite terrifying, right? So if I make a mistake, please feel free to, to, to shout out because uh, it would just be embarrassing otherwise. OK, so this is my first particle. I'm um, just going to make sure that's purest green, shall I? Uh, let's just try that. Oh, there you go. That's a bit better, isn't it? That's a bit more purest green. Um, Black Adder reference, no. OK. So obviously, am I really old? <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably am. OK, so um, that's, that's us. Well, let's, let's make it uh, animate, right? Because a square is cool, but it's much better if it's, if it's moving around a bit. So let's, let's make this square animate. Well, if you want to do any sort of animation in, in JavaScript, well, you've got to somehow do something over and over again. The modern, the modern fancy way to do it is with the request animation frame. But, you know, I'm live coding. I'm just going to use set interval. And astonishingly, it works reasonably well. Um, so I'm going to call my loop 1,000 divided by 60 milliseconds. With, that's the interval, right? So it's uh, about 16 milliseconds, 16.6. Um, so every 16.6 milliseconds, my loop function will get called. So let's make my loop function. So now my rectangle is getting drawn 60 times a second. Yeah? I can, OK. It's, Bit boring. Let's make a variable. Yeah, now we're talking. Right, <laughs> variable. It's called x. So instead of drawing our rectangle at zero, let's draw it at x, and then we can. Oh yeah, there you go. Oh, but you see, like with the canvas, every time you draw stuff into it, it's completely persistent. Whatever you do, you're just changing the pixels. So, so you're going to leave them there. So in order to create animation, the first thing we need to do is actually clear the entire canvas. Uh, with, oh, I can't type. <laughs> I'm just going to say my hands are too cold to type. That's why. There you go. So we've got animation. We've got an animating square. Yeah. That's what, oh, thank you. <laughs> You're too, too kind. Right. OK, so we've got one particle. Uh, that's a good start. But let's, um, well, let's wrap this particle up. Well, let's, first of all, let's make it a bit smaller, because it's a bit big for a particle. Particles generally are a bit smaller. That's better. Um, and let's, let's wrap it up into an object, yeah? So with JavaScript, you can just make dynamic objects. Oh, nearly forgot to do that. Um, so now, here, instead of just drawing my particle at x, I'm going to draw it at p.x. I can go, it's quite nice, actually. Often I'll do this with a mixed audience. It's quite cool with programmers. I can just go, pure, pure. Yeah. <laughs> OK, right. Um, so now I've wrapped it up into a particle, which means that a particle object, so I can draw it p.x, p.y, and then I can, well, actually, you know what? I can also make velocity, right? So vel x, um, let's say 5 vel y, 5, right? So we've got our x and y velocity. That's the amount of pixels that it changes uh, per frame. Uh, vel x, there's some muttering. Have I made a mistake? No? You're just, just talking. How rude. Um, OK, so, um, so we've now got my particle. Now I can change the direction. Well, let's just put, put the particle in the beginning, at the, in the middle of our canvas. So width divided by 2, uh, canvas height divided by 2. Right, so now it starts in the middle. Um, but it, you can see it always goes in the same direction. So let's give it a random velocity. 
Oh, look at that, running out of space. That's how much code I've typed. Um, <laughs> actually, you know what? I could just put that on a separate line, couldn't I? Yeah, that's a bit neater. Yeah, I can see all the coders, OCD coders in the room going, Oh, my God. oh, actually, oh, look, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a sp there's no space there, and then there's spaces there, and then there's no space. Then what's going on? It's just chaos. All right, I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'll tidy it up a little bit. Come on, I'm live coding. I can't do the most tidiest code. It's terrifying. Right. Okay, so let's give it a, a, a random velocity. I want to know how to do random numbers in JavaScript. Math.random, what does it return? A random number between zero and one. Um, a bit louder next time, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's fine, we're a bit shy, it's fine. Uh, Math.random between zero and one, but I've, if I want a random range between minus five and plus five, well, I just multiply it by 10 and subtract five, right? You all, you're all good at that, so I don't even need to explain that, right? I can break that out into a separate function. I'm not going to do it today. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I break it out into a function. <laughs> Just do whatever I want, it's brilliant. I'm creative. Um, okay, so now, uh, whenever I run this, it, the particle should be going in a completely different direction. Yeah? Okay, cool, right, so that's good. We've got, we know now how to make a particle and give it a random velocity. Yeah, any questions so far? No, you're, it's all pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's, this code is not that hard, but just you wait, right? Because one particle, yeah, it's okay, but what about hundreds of particles? That's where it gets cool. Well, I'm, I'm excited anyway. <laughs> right, so um, instead of now just making one particle at the beginning, well, let's make a new particle every single frame. And up here, I'm going to make an, uh, an array to, to put those particles in. You know, I've been programming in C++ so much lately, it's quite weird. Uh, I keep wanting to type int instead of var and stuff like that. So if I do a mistake, please just shout out and shame me. That, that's all part of the fun. Right, so. Um, I've got an array to put my particles in, so let's push the particle into the end of the array. And now instead of just drawing one particle, I can go around uh, for loop. Oh, nearly typed in. <laughs> so from zero to the number of particles, uh, and then I'm going to get the particle out of that array. So now I'm updating, I'm drawing and updating every single particle. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. And whoa. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? OK, so that's just the start, right? There's so much. I'm going to just keep going. I, often this is all I have time for, but you know, I, I never usually start a talk with programming. I'm, quite, I'm enjoying it. So let's keep going. Let's, let's be creative, right? What else can we do? Well, we can give the particle a size. Yeah, at the moment it's just 10, uh, whatever is hard coded in there, but let's, let's make it whatever my size property is. Uh, so, yeah, the same. <laughs> but I can do math.random times 10. Now they're all different sizes, but actually I don't like that so much. But what I, what I can do now, I do have a size, is that I can shrink it a little bit. And you might think, well, let's subtract something from size a little bit. And I could do that. I could do like minus equals 0.5 or something. Um, but that doesn't really work, right? Because it goes into negative numbers, and then it's, they start. Well, that's quite a cool effect, I suppose. <laughs> there's, there's no wrong, I suppose. Um, but I would rather um, that it, it kind of shrunk and, and stood in, in a way. Well, I mean, I suppose I could do this, right? If p dots, oh, this is terrible. I hate this sort of programming. Uh, I could put a conditional in, right, so that it doesn't grow again. But if you notice about the way that these particles shrink, it's quite linear. Well, it's very linear, in fact. So I find it's a lot nicer is, is instead of doing, instead of subtracting a value from size, you can just like multiply it by a number close to one. Yeah, so if you multiply it by 1, obviously it doesn't change. If you multiply it by 0.5, then it becomes half of what it was. If you multiply it by 0.96, then it becomes 96% of what it was. And you can see now it takes not only a little bit longer for the particles to shrink, but also as they shrink, they get a bit slower. It shrinks a bit slower as they get small, and that's a much more pleasing uh, effect. And as you do more sort of graphical programming, you get to realize how these maths things can affect those what else can I do? I could add some gravity. Uh, 
what is it, Vel Y, uh, plus equals, I don't know, 0.5, something like that. There you go. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Um, or I can even add a collision. Uh, what can I do? If uh, P dot Y is greater than, I don't know, canvas dot height minus 100. So if it, if it goes greater than the height minus 100, so 100 off the bottom, then what can, what can I do? Well, I should probably just multiply the Y vel by minus 1. Let's try that. <laughs> so it bounces off the bottom. If I want it to not be perfectly bouncy, I can you know, make that 0.8, and then they don't bounce quite so high. Let's make them shrink a little bit less. Yeah, so straight away, we've got some pretty cool effects with like the least amount of code ever. That, to me, is really exciting, right? Because it's much better, rather than like, if I wanted to do this effect or some, any sort of animation in After Effects or whatever, I'd have to actually just do it all myself, right? But it's much more exciting to me to teach the computer how to do it, right? Especially when there isn't that much code, right? It's not that much code. A small amount of code, sophisticated effect, I'm just going to show you the best particle effect in the world ever. Are you ready for this? I feel like you need to just prepare yourself a moment. In fact, you can't go straight to the most amazing particle effect in the world ever. You have to build up slowly to it. So here's the first step of the most amazing particle effect in the world ever, uh, which is this, right? So you can see it's basically the same kind of code that I just showed you, except now the particles all start at the mouse position, right? So wherever the mouse is, that's where the particles come out. And you can see also, instead of just drawing a square, I'm using this bitmap image, which is a sort of glowy, uh, glowy white image with a, uh, with a black background. So the first thing is, it doesn't look very cool. Uh, because the black background is obliterating the particles behind it. It's important possibly at this stage to realize that the particles are drawn from first to last, and the last one is the newest one, which is the biggest one, which is on top of uh, the front where the mouse is. It's the newest one that's on top of everything else because you draw that last. It's at the end of the array. Um, but there's this really cool thing that you can do in pretty much all graphics uh, platforms. Uh, which is instead of drawing bitmaps normally in this kind of overlay method, uh, you can use something called additive blending. So additive blending, once you've seen it, if, if some people have probably used it before, right? I'm, I'm sure. But once you've used it, once you understand what it looks like, you see it everywhere. Movie special effects, uh, games effects, everything uses additive blending. If you've used Photoshop before, <laughs> you've used Photoshop, right? <laughs> No, no, I just type. I don't use Photoshop, I type. Um, <laughs> um, if you've used Photoshop, you'll know the blend mode lighter. Uh, and lighter, what lighter does is the same as an additive blend. And ultimately, when you put a picture over another picture, only the, the light bits of the picture on top show up. So you can only make what's underneath lighter. Nothing in the picture on top makes the thing underneath any darker. So that's additive blending. You can do that in, uh, in JavaScript, in Canvas, by setting the global composite operation uh, to lighter. And in this example code, uh, I'll give you the code if you want. I'll, I'll stick a link up on Twitter. Uh, but in this, in this code, there's a particle object, and the particle sets the Canvas composite operation to lighter before it draws it. Are you ready for this? Whoa, look at that. Yeah, that's quite a lot cooler, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I know. No, no, no. no. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right, but that's still not the best particle effects in the world ever, right? Because right? there's something else, right? First of all, um, like, if you wanted to recreate, like, there's so much. When you're doing creative coding, there's so much that you, you want to get across, like an impression. Yeah, so if I wanted to get the impression of fluidity or liquid, well, you can actually do um, fluid dynamics if you want. There's loads of JavaScript examples of that. It's crazy processing. You can probably do it. Um, but sometimes you don't need to if you just want to create the effect of fluidity. And one way I, I love to do that is actually by um, inheriting a proportion of the mouse's velocity and adding that to the particle's velocity when you start, when you start the particle. Um, so the way I've done that is I'm, I'm getting the, the difference in the mouse's position in the last frame compared to the current frame, subtracting one from the other, taking that as the mouse velocity. If I add like 40% of that mouse velocity to the particles, then 
as I, oh, hang on, plus. I deleted a plus, right? Um, then you get a bit of the mouse velocity affecting the particles, and you can see there that it gives a really nice fluid effect. But that's still not the best particle effects in the world ever. There's one more thing. OK, so these are quite nice sort of hot spots of particles, aren't they? I really love that aesthetically. But I really want to make them sort of look more sparkly, right? I want them to shimmer. Uh, any ideas how you might do that? I can't hear anything. One person. Particle equals Oh, come on. <laughs> how do you think that might work? <laughs> yeah, I know, but if you... What do you think that does? Don't just say it makes them shimmer. <laughs> Have you got any... Can you imagine it? How does it look? Something with opacity. Opacity. See, that's quite a good answer, opacity. Um, it's... Uh, it doesn't usually work very well with opacity. Well, not in this case, right? Because I really love the hot white spots there, right? Because it looks really glowy. Now, if I was to add maybe, if I was to make the opacity a random value, then they obviously would get brighter and darker, but they'd also um, kind of get a bit grayer, right? They'd look a bit gray, and that wouldn't, I'd lose that real sparkliness. So there's something else that I could change the size. Yes, exactly right. So that's what. That's what this does, if I just uncomment that. Are you ready for the best particle effect in the world ever? <laughs> Here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, the best particle effect in the world ever. <laughs> Whoa, look, it's like, wow. <laughs> it's kind of a bit of a problem with the work that I do is that if you do something really well, then you just can't stop staring at it. <laughs> like, it's, it's like all your productivity gone. It's like you, you've been really productive, but nothing looks any good. And then something that's good, that's it. That's it for the rest of the day. You're just like, <laughs> <laughs> so I might, just, I might just leave that for the rest of my talk. No, no, I'm joking. Right, so um, before I move, oh, just really, I'm using up all my time just doing coding. I'm quite enjoying it. It's fine, isn't it? It's fine, I'm just going to carry on. Right, so um, before I do that, I'm just going to show you this demo. Now, this probably to you looks really complicated, right? Um, but it's actually quite simple. So the particles are basically the same as the particles that I've been looking at so far. They've all got their own velocity and position. They're bouncing off the floor, yeah, like, like I showed you. But there's, there's a bit on the outside. If it's outside those x values, then it just falls down. So that's quite cool as well. But you'll notice that all these particles are colliding with each other. Right? That probably sounds like the hardest thing in the world. But once you get to know how to do these techniques, um, it's actually relatively simple. If you wanted to recreate the physics accurately, it'd be very, very difficult. Right? But we don't need to recreate them accurately. We just need to recreate them effectively and convincingly. So in this case, I'm not actually really checking to see if the circles are colliding and modeling that in physics. All I'm doing is seeing if the circles are overlapping. Yeah, so I'm just doing an overlap test. And if they are overlapping, then I'm applying a force to pull them apart in opposite directions. I'm not moving them in any way apart from just adjusting each of their velocities a little tiny bit in the direction that should separate those two circles. And you can see you can get some quite convincing physics. And that's how a lot of the 2D uh, physics engines work. Like Box 2D, for example, they're not really modeling physics. They're just doing these overlap tests and, and applying these impulses. So there's some really cool stuff here. And this is all kind of to do with, I suppose, games programming. Right? I've done a lot of games programming. I think probably a lot of people were inspired to learn to program because of games. Actually, who here learned to program because they wanted to make a game? Let's have a look. Yeah, so quite a lot of you. I right? keep your hand up if you ever made a game. Did you finish it? <laughs> hand up if you finished it. Oh, yeah, a few of you. That's quite impressive. <laughs> OK, I mean, but it's quite hard, though, isn't it? When you start making a game, it's hard because you don't know all these cunning little tricks, right? So um, for me, that's, it's been quite a long time before I realized that you could do it really simply. So that's a good lesson as a programmer. Right, I suppose I better get back to my actual talk. <laughs> that's, Let's see how that works. Oh, yeah, lunar trails. Right, I'm going to talk about lunar trails. So, um, oh, man, I've got no time. Uh, I'm really going to have to skip, 
skip, skip. Uh, Luna Trails is a project involving this game, Luna Lander. Who remembers Luna Lander from 1979? <laughs> yes, we're all, uh, we're all old. I was actually seven in 1979. So I don't know. I think I picked up on it maybe a bit later. Um, this is actually my Luna Lander arcade cabinet. I bought it on eBay. Um, it's in LA. I, I don't think I'm ever going to see it. Uh, my friends in LA are looking after it for me. They've had it for several years now. I don't think I'm ever going to get it shipped to the UK. That's fine. It's a brilliant game. Here it is. Here's the game. In fact, a few years ago, I made a, 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 a recreation of this Lunar Lander. In fact, you guys can all go and play this game yourself, moonlander.seb.ly. Uh, you can play this game and, and try and land the space. It's a fiendishly difficult game uh, because your thrusters are almost completely ineffectual. Yeah, it works on mobile as well. It's got mobile controls. Go on, open it up. I don't mind. I won't, I won't judge you. If you want to just play a game, that's fine. Because the best part is that, oh, hang on. Should I try and land it? Oh, I'm never going to be able to, am I? <sighs> It's because I was, I was talking. I can do it normally, but I've got no time. Um, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to make a multiplayer version of Lunar Lander? So I did. Um, the first step of that was to get everyone to transmit their position to my server. I ended up just staring at people playing the game. It was actually... Um, <laughs> That's, that's all I did. And, and actually, I left. This is probably all you, you lot, isn't it? I guess. It does get about 30,000 plays a month, so it might be some people off the internet. Um, <laughs> but I thought I'd draw a little trail as people played the game, right? Just so I could see whether my system was all working and stuff. But I realized if I left that for a few hours, that these beautiful trails images uh, would appear. I don't know, you're just all going to stare at that. But instead, I'm sorry. I'm just going to leave that running. We'll come back to it. Um, I realized that you would get images like this. Right, and that's quite cool, isn't it? It's sort of like I accidentally did an art. <laughs> right, so um, I, th I always thought, wouldn't it be great to actually scale that up and put it in the real world? So this is what I did. I, I, I made an arcade cabinet. You can buy them flat pack. That makes it a bit like IKEA. <laughs> that helps. Um, so I, but I had to make uh, custom controls. You know, I did metal work and stuff, obviously, for a programmer. That's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so there's the arcade cabinet. That's just running a full screen browser. <laughs> it's just uh, a Mac. <laughs> Using an Arduino to convert the, the, the controls into key presses. Um, but alongside, behind, I wanted to make a big hanging drawing robot uh, that drew the trails on a big wall. And so I got way too uh, interested. I learned way too much about motors and servo motors. Come and talk to me later. I could bore you forever about motors. Um, so there we are. That's the motors. And basically, that, the drawing machine was this big hanging plotter like that. And it had motors at either end, which wound the wire in or out. And you could draw everything. And you could actually, using a silver sharpie, you could draw these beautiful white images on the wall in a three meter wide drawing. Here's a video. So you can see, actually, the control of the, the hanging plotter was quite fine. You know, it could write these letters. People didn't always realize that because the trails were very flowing and uh, curvy. No time. I have to move on. I'm really sorry. Go and look at the video. It's online. Pixel Pyros. Pixel Pyros is another one of my projects. You know, I mentioned I like doing particles, so sometimes it's nice. I mean, particles are actually quite versatile. I use them quite often, but it's very unusual that you get a project that is all particles. Uh, so Pixel Pyros, it's a digital fireworks display. Outdoors on a massive screen, 18 by 12 meters the screen. I mean, it's massive. I, I'm not sure how wide this stage is. It's probably not 18 meters. It's probably 15 meters, I would guess. Something like that. It's wider than this state. Or maybe, I don't know. It seems really big. Um, <laughs> probably wouldn't fit in here. Uh, and using high power projectors and lasers, I create fireworks on the screen. But each one is controlled by a member of the audience who touches these orbs of light. Can you just about see the orbs of light along the bottom there? If you put your hand in front of that, then a firework comes out. So every single firework controlled by the audience. You can see the screen there. We rig it on these massive scissor lifts. Um, oh, lasers. I'm quite into lasers. <laughs> Um, I learned how to make lasers for the tour of Pixel Pirates because before that I was just using projectors and I thought wouldn't it be cool to use lasers because lasers they look so cool like 
they emit light, right, doesn't it? It looks like a light source. It doesn't look like reflected light. But... So I thought, oh, I'll buy a laser. I thought, how many particles can I make with a laser? So I was trying it at home. This is my little laser. Um, and this is like here, you can see how the laser moves in between the spots, because I left the laser on. So you can see me trying to figure out how to control the laser. This was a one watt laser that I bought. To give a, that doesn't sound very much, does it, one watt? Um, but this laser pointer, I think, is half a milliwatt. So 2,000 times brighter than this laser pointer. Well, but that wasn't bright enough, right? This laser, though, it's so bright that it will cause permanent retinal damage to your eyeball if it goes into your eye for 30 nanoseconds. Yeah, so that, they're dangerous, right? Even this one watt one. Um, yeah, it's quite scary, isn't it? <laughs> just, just sort of sunk in. Don't, don't point them in your eyes. Um, <laughs> the blink reflex is 250 milliseconds, right? So you haven't got a chance. Uh, the lasers we took on tour are 11 watts. This is me trying out the 11 watt laser for the first time. Um, well, you can imagine how quickly an 11 watt laser will blind you. Um, but not only that, like if this laser stops moving for any reason, there are these little mirrors that move the laser. If it stops moving, it will start burning a hole in, in the wall <laughs> or my screen. So, so lasers are fun. Um, here's here's a, a little video of Pixel Pyros. I'll talk you through it. This was the first time we brought a laser out. As the tour went on, and the more times I've run Pixel Pyros, I've just added more and more lasers. But this was the first, the first time we brought a laser. That's the, one of the projectors. So even the two projectors that we use are pretty massive. They're 15,000 uh, lumens each. We use infrared cameras to detect the movement of hands uh, on, the, on the lights. Um, and there are lots of different styles of fireworks as well. That's the laser there. He's, he's actually masking the laser. You have to mask the laser so that it doesn't go outside where you want it to go and blind people. Anyway, lots of different st styles of lasers, loads of health and safety um, documentation as well. We have this thick book we have to send to the cows. <laughs> So fun. Um, anyway, yeah, so each scene is a different style of fireworks. So you can see that one sort of inspired by Tron, like vector graphics. And you can see the bright spots in that are the, are when we turn the laser on. And then there are other fireworks which are sort of low resolution, 8 bit uh, graphics fireworks, like these ones, which are meant to be if a Commodore 64 could do fireworks, what would they look like? Uh, and then there's sort of more realistic, traditional looking fireworks as well. And as with all my projects, you learn pretty quickly. It's like every, any project that you've got, just add a game, right? So uh, with this, I added Space Invaders, probably the biggest game of Space Invaders ever, with 25 or 30 people playing at once, about several thousand uh, invaders. I also did Asteroids. And with Asteroids, the bullets are actually projected by the laser, which you can see there. Running out of time, so I'm going to move on. OK, oh, laser arcade, this is cool. I've really got no time to talk about this. But this is a project where you shoot Nerf gun bullets at a laser projected target. Crazy complex array of microphones that pick up the bullets. Check that out if you're interested. Laser light synth. So I was a musician. Everything's got lasers. Oh, yeah. Since I learned to use lasers, everything's got lasers. I was a musician for many years, and I thought, um, wouldn't it be great if, there could be a, if everyone could experience what it's like to be a musician? So I made a musical instrument that was easy to play. I took out all the wrong notes. I locked it into time, uh, and I ended up with these light synths, which are super bright LEDs, these, these keyboards. And while you play them, lasers project up the building. That's quite cool. You can see it there. Oh, man, they're so bright, these super bright LEDs. You can see they're making making them touch sensors there made out of copper foil that I cut out on a vinyl cutter. So much detail in this project. I absolutely loved it. It was so cool. Um, but I just literally spent months like staring at little LEDs that are so, so bright. It's just like, I think I've still got retinal burn. I can still just see dots in my eyes. It's fine. Um, yeah, there you go. Oh, it's a really fun project. Go and check it out on the internet because I'm running out of time. Ah, oh, Smashing Conference, right. So Smashing Conference is a web conference. You might know it, Smashing Magazine. They wanted me to do something uh, for their Oxford uh, events uh, oh, a couple of years ago. I've done, I've done loads of their conferences since then. Um, so I thought, well, I went along and saw this. I was just going to project some lasers on the wall. But then I went to see the architecture. You can see this beautiful domed building. And I thought, well, really, I've got to do something a bit special with that. 
Um, but we thought, well, let's just make an animation, right? So there's this animation on the screen, and this goes for a minute or so, and people think, oh, this is a nice animation. And then we break out of the screen uh, and, and turn the laser on. Here it comes. And so I don't know if you could see, but there was a um, pipe organ in the background, so I literally had no choice but to make the pipe organ a graphic equaliser. <laughs> so yeah, this is quite a fun project. I ended up totally um, map you know, mapping this dome building. Uh, with the with the software, you know, it's kind of crazy, really. Um, but it was, yeah, really fun. Some really fun effects you could do with that. And uh, like I mentioned, I always uh, add a game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought I could I could play this game with you. Obviously, I'm really sorry to say that I didn't. Let's just have a look at this. Oh, gave up? Did you? Uh, <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't bring a laser with me. Unfortunately, the laser, the 11 watt laser, is about 30 grand, right? It's, um, and it's about at least, you know, a thousand quid whenever I hire it. So, I don't know. Maybe next year you can find some budget, and I'll bring. <laughs> I'll bring a laser. I don't know. Maybe we can get sponsorship. Get on that uh, business team, right? Uh, <laughs> But um, so this uh, is, oh, let's have a look. So this is the setup for um, Smashing Conference in New York, uh, which was actually using the, uh, the set for Avenue Q. And they had a screen in the middle of the set, and obviously I had to laser around it. I did a slightly different laser show from the Oxford one. But this is quite interesting. This is my control panel uh, for the laser stuff. Let's see if I can get some lasers. Here we are. So this is the show. You can see that squiggly line is the laser and the, and the shapes on the screen. They're, um, they're just coming from the projector. But there's a lot of complexity using a laser um, because you need to figure out the path of the laser. You need to figure out every single... The, the laser is controlled by sending positions and colours. So the laser moves from the, each one position to the next, you know, 30,000 times a second. So you can see there the white dots are the path that the laser needs to take. And when you're doing stuff in real time, you need to figure out which order to, to, to render things. It's actually pretty complicated. Um, there you go, nice psychedelic effects there. Pretty fun. Um, but anyway, I shouldn't digress. I should get straight to the point. We're going to play a game of, uh, of, of Flappy Bird. Um, but it's not Flappy Bird because it's controlled by you all uh, applauding, right? So it's Clappy Bird. <laughs> yeah. uh, and because it's projected with a laser, it's laser Clappy Bird, or sometimes I get it wrong. It's really embarrassing. I say lazy, lazy clapper, whatever. <laughs> OK, so um, I suppose, let's just have a look. What have I got? Um, I should turn off the preview. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, turn that off. Um, go right back to the beginning. There we are. OK, so uh, I might have to do a bit of uh, adjustment. Um, but yeah, essentially, like the louder you clap, the higher the bird flies. It's, it's fiendishly difficult. Um, most. Audiences are lucky to get one point. Um, <laughs> but it's just to step up the competition a little bit, I did uh, State of the Browser, the London Web Standards, on Saturday. Best ever score in Laser Clappy Bird. I think they got five points. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. OK, you ready to play um, Laser Clappy Bird? I should probably just test it worse. Can you just applaud? All right, that seems to <laughs> that seems to work. Okay, so are you ready then to play Laser Clappy Bird? Yeah. Okay, here we go. In three, two, one, go. <laughs> I'll just turn the sensitivity up a bit, shall I? <laughs> All right, let's try again. Three, two, one, go.
<laughs> equalized. <laughs> so what do you think? Do you think you can beat them? Of yeah? You want to give it a try? <laughs> Three, two, one, last chance, go! <laughs> You know what, that's, that's perfectly decent. Five points is an excellent score. <laughs> Joint high score with London Web Sanders. That's brilliant. Well done. Give yourself a round. No, actually, don't. <laughs> OK, do. Go on. I just was a bit worried about the state of your hands. And obviously, I wanted to give you a chance to recover before the end of my talk. Um, uh, uh, what am I talking about? OK, so um, I, I'm just going to talk briefly about the Internet of Things. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Such a weird term, isn't it? Things, thing, internet of, th oh, just, oh. sounds weird. Um, I prefer to call it stuff that talks to the interwebs, or uh, STTTI, STI, ST4I. Um, ST4I, formerly known as Internet of Things, is a really exciting thing to explore. So I've set up this workshop. The reason it's exciting to explore is because no one really knows what it's for yet. Or at least, whenever someone tries to come up with a business idea for Internet of Things, ST4I, formerly Internet of Things, um, the business ideas are always stupid, right? <laughs> like a toothbrush that connects to your fat. I mean, what, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but in my view, the most fun and interesting Internet of Things ideas, it's ST4i, formerly IoT uh, things, are, are stupid art projects. Like my friend Dominic Wilcox, who made some GPS-enabled shoes with little lights on that point you the way home. <laughs> or, um, or, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of the guy now, a guy who does research. I saw him speak at Think, uh, Thinking Digital. And he made a, a, an, an internet-connected mouse trap that would tweet him whenever uh, a mouse was caught. <laughs> you know, now that's, the, that's cool, right? So, so for someone like me, it's the perfect time to explore internet of things. Sooner or later, they'll figure it out, and then I'll get bored and move on to something else. But right now, it's really fun. I made this ISS tracker. It counts down to the next time the ISS is about to overtake. Or it's what, overtake? Over, you know, over, go over. <laughs> Ugh, I can't talk. I can do programming. can't really talk. Um, yeah, so that's cool. So I've, I've got this workshop. If you're interested, st4i.com. I haven't run one for a little while. I'm trying to, it comes with this crazy kit. All that stuff I just showed you came with the kit, but I might have to rethink it because it would just take me months to get these kits together. Um, anyway, don't worry about that. I've got to move on. Right, obviously it's a keynote talk. I've seen other keynote speakers. They kind of, they're kind of cool, aren't they? They have useful information. They don't just play games and stuff. So I was sort of watching the other speakers and I was like, yeah, I could do that. I can do advice stuff. All right, let's do some advice. Learn new stuff. <laughs> that's my advice. Yeah, that's pretty cool advice, right? I love learning new stuff. I really, no, it's just it's so, I, yeah, I love learning new stuff. I realized during one talk, I was like, yeah, new stuff, learn it. It's brilliant, I love it. You know, electronics, Arduino, C++, let's learn it. It's, it's amazing, and I just, in that, you know, sometimes you just realize have you ever had this when you're just saying something and in the middle of it you just realize, oh, you're just lying? <laughs> yeah, you just, do you ever have that? I mean, it's not deliberate. You obviously believe it and then halfway through you're like, oh, it's not, so not true. <laughs> I hate learning new stuff. Learning new stuff is horrible. It's like you're a noob, right? That's the worst word ever, isn't it? Noob. <laughs> noob. <laughs> noob. Uh, I, was, I was just having a bit of trouble with this PHP framework. Noob. <laughs> oh, it's so annoying. So that's why it's really hard. And, and when it was, that's what puts you off, right? Battle through it, right? Because obviously by the time it comes to the end of it, uh, you've learnt it, and then you've done this cool thing. You feel pretty good. It was really hard. You got through it. I love having learned new stuff. 
Yeah, that's my first advice. Second advice, finish your projects. <laughs> <laughs> Who has ever embarked on a side project outside of where? Let's have a look. Hands up. Right, keep your hand up if you finished it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to finish projects. Why is it hard to finish projects? The last 10% of a project takes 90% of the time. <laughs> Right? It's, like, it's like, yeah, new project, exciting, yeah, you're steaming through it. It's like, yeah, solving all these problems. This is me coding, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It's like, and you're sort of, oh, I've nearly finished that. Oh, I'll just finish it tomorrow. You don't finish it. Or you try finishing it. It's like, oh, those are boring bits now. It's like, oh, you just got to finish it. Stick it on the internet, and then it's finished. But also, related to this piece of advice, is scope your projects better. Because <laughs> often, you know, you don't have much spare time, right? Most of you have probably got a day job. It's like, you'd, you can't embark on some crazy project. First of all, um, if you think it will take a week, well, that's quite a lot of evenings and weekends, isn't it? It's probably a month or two to start with. And then, of course, don't forget that the last 10% takes 90% of the time. So then it's probably going to be like six months or whatever. So just keep them small projects are fine. It's more important to finish it than to be big. Um, Oh, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my last piece of advice. There's no such thing as a natural talent. Show me someone you think is really talented, and I'll show you someone who just works really hard. It's about, in my view, it's about your attitude, right? It's like about really just working. The only reason I can do any of these things, I don't think I'm particularly smart or clever. I'm just, like, really stubborn, <laughs> you know, and I just really work at stuff, and I think that's good for my brain. I think it's good. Um, so, yes. That's my final, uh, that, doesn't sound very, that doesn't sound very good, actually, does it, that advice? There's always someone better than you. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. That's not meant to be depressing. That's meant to be, really, I, I just obviously I haven't quite got the tone right. But this is meant to say, don't worry, right? Because there's always going to be someone who seems better than you, but they're just better at that thing that they've worked really hard to do. You've got your own thing. Even if you did something like they did, their project, it would be different because it was your project and it would reflect you and your personal ideas and your personality and, and you're probably better at them at some things as well. So don't be disheartened when you see other amazing people. Uh, there's always someone better than you. Just don't worry about it. I hope it's been inspiring and interesting. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great. <laughs>